specifically at a critique of the Presidential Climate Commission and an overview of policy work. Uh, each speaker will have 10 minutes. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, it is important for us to always be critical um, of the kind of things that, you know, when it comes to climate commissions and presidential climate commissions, and we need to monitor and see if they're achieving what they say they will be achieving, which we don't know, actually. Um, so our first speaker is Shakira Dawood, and she will give us an overview of the PCC critique. So over to you, Shakira. Yes, and I'm also a fellow at the All Socioeconomic Research Institute, also known as ISG. I'm with the 2022 Fellow Leadership Program. And today I'm here to present a little bit on the Presidential Climate Commission critique document titled A Framework for a Just Transition in South Africa. For those of you who have read the Presidential Climate Commission document or the critique, um, which we do have in our bag, by the way, uh, it's not in no particular order of it, so just a disclaimer. Uh, firstly, I'd like to ask, uh, what is a uh, transition? Can I have any takeaways on defining what is a just transition? Yes. I think for me, a just transition will be a transition based on a, 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 a just approach to development and human uh, uh, social impact. Yes, exactly. Anyone else with any different thing? Anyone else wants to tell me about meaning the economy? No. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so, yes. Uh, the framework document has these various definitions that are all encompassing, seemingly. Uh, it's of achieving a quality of life social inclusion, eradication of poverty, and a human-centered approach of the transformation, which is well and good, again, seemingly. And this brings me to the first critique. So the document has this, this they claim that there's this broad consensus on how you define a just transition with these multiple supporting quotes as shown in the previous slide. And when you read them all together, what you realize that all they do is make mention of that it's and it makes mention of that it affirms 2050 as the critical date for the net zero emissions. And while Prof. Answer also mentioned that, um, it may be true for this global approach, but for South Africa with our current heating trends and dynamics, that cannot be so. And this brings me to my second critique as well, where the document does not upfront acknowledge that South Africa is different. We are one of the 10 climate hotspots. We experience global warming differently. In fact, we have a doubling in our average, well, almost a doubling in our average temperatures. And so what that means is that when we overshoot 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, we are going to be experiencing about approximately three degrees in our temperature increase. And this should have been foregrounded in the document to underline the climate emergency challenge we face and place us on a climate emergency footing at least. So South Africa, despite being a country that's wrapped by deep inequality, and we've experienced that these disastrous kind of catastrophes, and I don't think I need to make mention of them. There's the case of flooding and um, a Cape Town drought, but we're living the climate emergency crisis. And the framework document does not recognize the climate emergency, and it assumes South Africa, like any other country on the planet, facing a gradual, even, and linear approach I mean, we're not. The worse it gets globally, the worse it will be for us in terms of the shocks and risks to all socio-ecological systems that we need and depend on to survive. And for that note, we also know that carbon is one of our main greenhouse gases. It's detrimental. It's the most abundant in our atmosphere. And the document has no mention of our carbon emissions. It fails to acknowledge that we are one of most carbon industrial, uh, most carbon intensive economies, right? And that we're also, according to some studies, the 12th highest carbon emitter. That's according to like 195 countries. And where we as a country should be taking steps to cut our carbon emissions, they also showed us how serious they are about the just transition where back in 2020, we've had them approving oil and gas 
plans along the KZN coast, and speaking about the KZN coast, that's where I'm from. So with that authorization of the new oil and gas explorations, which have been appealed by very concerning citizens and the SGCEA, which does great work, by the way, um, and the case was won. If that would have gone through, it would further deepen our climate our reliance on climate, on fossil fuels and in turn creating more carbon pollution and increasing our vulnerability to climate change impacts. And as I've mentioned already, that it, it doesn't help that our country is wrapped by deep inequality, which is talking fuels to recognize. The fossil fuel impacts, which one have we not experienced? We've experienced all of them. And this brings me to my first point. The document also reads as a as though the just transition framework on offer. No, I'm reading the wrong thing, sorry. <laughs> the development of this framework reads like a top-down technocratic exercise rather than being by the lived experience of the worst worsening climate crisis. And it begs us to question how many flood, uh, tornado, wildfire communities have been consulted? How about the fisher communities when approving offshore and oil drilling? How many lessons were drawn from the climate shocks that our country has already experienced? South Africa needs a more effective democratic planning approach driven, driven from below and not by the technocrats in the state. And then it also reads that as though the just transition framework on offer is based on what the current ANC government is doing. In other words, a failing state with incoherent policies a lack of serious political will to mainstream the climate emergency, which is mentally the just transition. And in essence, this framework is not a South African framework. It's breaking new ground, but merely affirms the same political leadership we face on many fronts, which is being perpetuated by the ANC government. South Africa needs a decolonized and delinking approach to its economy to survive. Throughout the framework document, the economy is first and humans are seen as separate entities and not part of nature. The economy must be subordinated to the needs of society and nature. And as the picture says, humanity and nature are one. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that therefore the onus is upon us. We will have to continue to champion a vision of the deep just transition by affirming the centrality of the Climate Justice Charter, its plural visions, goals, principles, systemic alternatives, and a renewed radical pan-Africanism. The CJC is decolonial, eco-feminist, anti-capitalist, and anti-ecocide. It is the most transformative approach that African society has to the deep just transition and the worsening climate crisis. Let us build and accelerate the deep just transition from below now. We are running out of time. Thank you so much. Um, I think that that was very powerful and of course very informative. Um, I think we'll keep questions to after each of the panel. Shakira, that was really great. I think one of the things that I've been grappling with as well with regards to the presidential so privacy. Sorry, we can't hear you, so you're going to have to repeat what you were saying again. Okay, can you hear me? Is it because I'm too soft or is it, it just, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? I wonder. Come. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I want to say thank you, Shakira. That's what I said. Um, and also you raised some very important points around the just transition. And that if you're the presidential climate commission, you can't give it lip service. Um, I also think that some of the issues around, um, you know, having organizations that we know and work closely with and comrades uh, being on the commission and, and what has that achieved as well. That is something that I think will come out in the discussions as well. Our next presentation uh, is from Awande. Thank you comrades for keeping the time. And Awande will talk about the CJ deal framework. Thank you, Awande, over to you. Thank you, Farrell. And um, you've already given your hint that I'll be cautious of time, so I won't be a delinquent. And I'm happy today to talk about the CJ deal, the climate justice deal, um, which is the next step in the evolution of the climate justice charter. The first part of the charter is that it gave us a roadmap. 
it gave us a vision of what we want for our country, the alternatives that are possible, and how we're going to deal with the climate crisis. And the work of the climate justice deal is to give the concrete brick and mortar um, structure in terms of policies and ways in which we can achieve the alternatives put forward in the charter. So I'm just going to run through the framework of what this document is supposed to do and what it will present. Uh, it begins with a diagnostic overview, which gives context with regards to the, the crisis, um, what that means in South Africa, uh, environmentally, economically, uh, the CJC critique on economics and a climate justice systemic prohibition, where we're tackling the orthodoxy of um, current mainstream economic thinking, uh, the kind of economic thinking that has put us in this crisis and the kind of economic thinking that our government still subscribes to which has no ideas, which has no alternatives, which has no solutions to the problems that we're facing with. And we are putting forward what we're trying to counter that with, the different perspectives that we're drawing from, um, the plurivision that the Charter puts forward, uh, the macroeconomic pillars for a deep just transition, looking at the justification for why we need a deep just transition, uh, why we need it now, and also the principles that kind of hold up what we see as being a proper uh, deep just transition. And then we'll go into the thrusts uh, of the, the, the climate justice deal, which gives policy subscription uh, for the different alternatives and uh, programs which were in the charter. And we put it forward plans that the state should implement uh, to make these a reality. Uh, obviously, I'm gonna be short on time, so I can't go through all of them, but I'm gonna pick out a couple um, which will at least be food for thought and generate conversation, the discussion, and link quite well with the uh, conversation we've already been having uh, so far this morning. So I'm not going to go uh, too much into the environmental risks because I think Prof. Francois uh, gave a very comprehensive uh, presentation on that. Uh, and I'm not going to outdo the climate scientists. So I'll move on to the next as aspect of those impacts, which is the economic impact that come with uh, the climate crisis. So uh, in South Africa is a G20 country, but obviously uh, the size of our economy, we not, uh, you know, we don't match up to the other G20 nations, nor, nor do we even match up to the other BRICS nations. So that's just some context with regards to where our country is economically in this where you know the kind of um, muscle we have internationally with regards to how we're going to deal with this crisis. So uh, the pandemic obviously really hit the country. Uh, you're looking at around a seven percent decrease in GDP uh, during that period, um, and it's easy for politicians to understand uh, and conceptualize what that meant for our country. But the climate crisis also has similar ramifications. Um, or potential ramifications in terms of how we deal with it. So if you're looking at uh, moderate to high emission scenarios, so uh, the worse that we are at dealing with the crisis, uh, we could be losing between 131 to 197 billion rand um, by 2050. That's around 30 years from now. Um, this could obviously be worse with regards to how our economy is performing. Um, we could also be looking at 5.7 to 7.1% uh, loss uh, in how much agricultural sector contributes to GDP. And we know that agriculture is important uh, in terms of giving us food, but it's also important economically in terms of the work it generates uh, for people and also for the money that's available for our government to use. Um, under high emission scenarios, you're also losing, looking at around 13.5% uh, drop in uh, GDP by the end of the century. So that's by the year 2100. Uh, if we don't adapt uh, to this crisis, you're looking at costs of 3.1 billion um, by 2050 with regards to roads and 5.3 billion by 2100. These estimates that I'm giving are the low figures uh, because with regards to the high figures, it just goes through the roof. So I'm, I'm giving a best case scenario of the worst case scenario of what can happen, so to speak. Um, and then when it comes to biodiversity, it's, 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 it's quite difficult to measure that uh, with regards to what that means for the tourism industry. Tourism is really important in this country. It's overtaken mining in terms of what it contributes to our economy. Uh, we saw what was happening under COVID when people just couldn't come to the country. 
So imagine with the biodiversity loss of the oncoming crisis, how much more that's going to impact our tourism industry when there's nothing for people to come to see here because the land is dead, the animals are dead, we have nothing to offer. Um, that's not even speaking about what we as people who live in this country and this region of the world are going to lose in terms of um, that occurrence. Um, I mean, with regards to our fair share in terms of how we're dealing uh, with our emissions, uh, climate goals and policies of the government are insufficient. Um, with regards to our projections and our, and our pledges, we're not aligned with the 1.5 degree temperature limit that uh, uh, Professor Engelbrecht was talking about earlier or what the IPCC puts forward. Um, we're still thinking at around two degrees. Um, but the reality of where we are right now is that even with regards to what we've done, we're not even going to reach two degrees in terms of how we're trying to limit warming. Um, so what we really need to see in this country is around 43% reduction uh, or below 2010 levels uh, of emissions, uh, which is not what our government is looking at. With regards to the critique on economics and the climate justice systemic pluralvision, um, when you look at the, 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 the current economic paradigm, you look at the way in which uh, the government looks at economics, the way in which economics is thought of in the mainstream. Um, media has a big part to play, but also business and other uh, entities with, with that kind of muscle and clout. Um, it's, research has shown that global temperatures have um, skyrocketed uh, since the 1980s. So economically speaking, that coincides with the introduction of neoliberalism and neoliberal policies and a neoliberal approach, approach sorry, to uh, economics. Um, so those two things aren't necessarily, um, it's not a coincidence because there's real impacts and effects in terms of the economic policies that we put in place and the way in which we look at economics. So um, if we're going about as business as usual, we're going to get the same results. And that's what neoliberalism is. And that's the kind of you know economic um, approach that is currently uh, 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 dominating the way in which we approach planning, the way in which we approach what's important and how economies should function. Um, I mean, there's also other aspects to it. For example, I mean, the neoliberal approach also pursues the interest of business about the uh, interest of anything else. Uh, and obviously, all the conversations we've had up to this point with regards to the context of the, the heating, um, to the cost of living that we're speaking about now, uh, put these together with regards to the crisis of climate change. Obviously, a business as usual approach is not sufficient enough for us to get to where we need to get. Um, and another issue with regards to the neoliberal approach is also the way in which it's commodified the planet's resources, its capacity to look at everything through monetary uh, terms. Um, you know, and because we can look at it in monetary terms, it means we must exploit it for economic potential. It means that um, people's livelihoods, um, the way in which people are affected by uh, the environment and, and these economic activities come second to that potential. Um, so we need revolutionary measures, economically speaking, we have to go uh, beyond the brain. We have to do what we have not done before. We need to create just alternatives, uh, which go beyond the failures of the mainstream, which go beyond the idea of growth. We can't just be thinking about growth only. I think it's, it's, it's amazing to the point that we haven't called out the cop out that it is that uh, politicians speak about growth as the way in which they approach what they're doing and whenever they fail or things don't trickle down to the rest of the people in terms of these programs that they put in place, they always will use, no, but it's, it's, it's about growth. And we need to call it for what it is. We need to see through it. And we need to go beyond that, economically speaking. Um, and there are other economic perspectives and tools that we need to uh, seriously consider um, and take into how we implement these alternatives. Not one thing might not have all the answers, but there's a, a, a collection of ways in which each different perspective can contribute in towards creating the new, um, these post-development, deep growth, the pluriversal perspectives that exist um, and can be implemented. We also have to understand that we're living through a civilizational crisis. So this new economic model and approach has to deal with uh, the issues that have been brought 
out by the current order and the current way of doing things. We need to deal with the context of coloniality and its ramifications, the uncontrollable uh, wants for economic growth, uh, carbon and how it's embedded in our economy globally and locally, and also the way in which capital has uh, overtaken everything else as being what's the most valuable thing in our eco economy. Uh, it's unsustainable, it's prone to crisis, uh, and it cannot continue. So it's also important to take into uh, perspective, as we were talking in the first um, presentation, that there's no real short to medium term technological solutions that will help us deal with the climate crisis also. So we can't be waiting for those also. Um, so what we need is to decarbonize, we need to decapitalize and definancialize the economy, we need to degrowth in certain aspects of our uh, economic sectors, but also globally, uh, the countries of the global north uh, seriously need to consider um, uh, degrowth. We need to decolonize and we also need to decorrupt uh, our social, political, our social and political institutions through radical democracy. So the macroeconomic pillars for a deep trust transition, um, the justifications for a deep trust transition are the contradictions between limitless uh, capitalism in the pursuit for extraction, um, more production, trade, and the pillaging of the Earth's resources, uh, um, the conflict between the long understanding of uh, environmental growth constraints. Uh, we're living on a planet that only has so many resources, um, and also the way in which our governments, these multinationals, are unable to combat or to deal with the climate crisis, or they've been unwilling to. Um, the tension between uh, the emissions that the Western and developed countries have been able to uh, put out into the atmosphere um, over the past century versus the aspiration of developing countries like ours who still want to grow and develop. So we say that we should burn and burn and burn coal because we want to be like them, we want to reach them. But the more we do that, there will be no planet for us to live on where we can be like them. So there's, 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 we have to deal with that tension also. And there's also an argument being put forward by developing countries like ours that the remaining COVID budget must be used by us. We must be able to emit as much as we can possibly while we still can. Um, we need to think deeply about these arguments that people are putting forward. And then also the inequality or the, the, the disjuncture between the way in which the global economy is structured um, and also take into account that there are countries who will benefit in the heating world, and there are countries who will work against um, us transitioning away from the way in which we're doing things. Uh, there are countries who it's in their interest to slow down such a transition, and we have to be clear about that, we have to be real about that. And the principles for a deep just transition, um, we need to move away beyond um, this focus on just growth. Um, and you know, even though critiques of the current economic paradigm work, they're not enough. Uh, we also need to put forward alternative macroeconomic policies to show that the way in which the economy is structured right now is not enough. And the main areas in which we focus on have to be around poverty, distribution and redistribution of, of, of resources, um, the environment, the policy tools and the objectives that we put forward, and democracy and the protection of um, identity and other groups within our society. So the various thrusts along which these policies are being drawn um, are addressing inequality, um, policies under water and food sovereignty, dealing with that issue, uh, the question of climate jobs, which is something which has now begun to enter into the mainstream, defining and drawing up and framing what these jobs are, what they look like, um, rapid decarbonization, the processes that we need to put in place to decarbonize our society, uh, zero waste policies and zero waste systems at uh, local and national level, uh, ecocentric manufacturing, because we do need manufacturing capacity to be able to achieve some of these goals, um, the financing that is necessary to achieve this, and then democratic pl planning and a people-driven climate justice state. So I'm conscious of time, I'm gonna run through these quick, but just to give people a taste of um, some of these policies and their purposes. So we have an inequality challenge. We spoke about that previously in the previous uh, session. And we have to, addressing inequality has to be 
part of this program and how we look at this. Um, Universal Basic Income Grant is the program that just spoke about previously. It's one of the programs that we put forward in policies in which we will implement to address inequality uh, through the redistribution, uh, uh, utilizing that method. Democratic Public Utilities or Universal Public Services is another program which we put in place to minimize inequalities. Um, you know, people's access to services, see why service delivery protests are a huge thing in South Africa, is because that's also a sign of where inequalities lie. Um, we need to expand and, and ramp up people's ability to access services, um, but we also need to make them universally um, accessible. So this is not either or, this is along with a universal basic income grant, or something that's put in place. Um, will also necessitate the mobilization of a large number of workers. So it also creates jobs because we need jobs in all these sectors and all these services that we try to pull out. And the way in which we have to look at it is that we are at war right now. And when a country is at war, it uses all of its resources, all of its, its know-how and capabilities to deal with that pro uh, problem. Um, so this is what the universal public services will try to put in place. We're looking at high quality public health education institutions, um, which will obviously necessitate more doctors, nurses, teachers, uh, care workers. We're also talking about other public services such as transportation system, broadband, making uh, data and, and Wi-Fi and internet also freely accessible to people um, as a 21st century service. A job guarantee to make sure that if people want work, because it's plenty of work to do, um, that can be given. Uh, because we need to recruit people, we need to mobilize people at a large scale, uh, more so than what we've ever seen. So these services for them to run, for these programs put in place, we need to be able to put in place a job guarantee to a low carbon economy. And also initiating a climate insurance fund, uh, because as uh, we saw earlier, there will be a number of shops where we saw in case again, and we need to create those kind of institutions that provide that resilience for people uh, in society. So we have things such as a road accident fund, an unemployment insurance fund, and a climate insurance fund is something that we'll also need. Climate jobs is a number of different climate jobs, but the main ones we're looking at, or so the main ones which we're uh, discussing are the ones in terms of disaster management, firefighting and disaster management services, we need to wrap that up. Um, you can see that the country is ill-equipped for natural disasters and will need uh, some kind of structure that is um, reliable in terms of a disaster management service uh, at a local and regional and national level, which mobilizes communities and people where they are to be able to deal with disasters if they were to hit those areas. Um, natural climate solutions and a climate works program where we'll employ young people, unemployed people across the country uh, to help in recuperating wetlands, rehabilitation of natural environments, regenerating uh, ecosystems and training and facilitating uh, people to be able to do that work on a local program um, at, local, at local level. Local governments also will have local government climate jobs programs uh, to help remove fire loads in, in, in local governments and municipalities, retrofitting homes in public institutions and fixing water leaks and infrastructure um, across the country because we also see you drive through South African cities and towns that infrastructure is failing, it's crumbling. So not only do we need to fix and reinvigorate infrastructure, but we also need to make it resilient and adaptive to the needs of the climate crisis. So there's a lot of work to be done there also. Uh, cultural and arts programs are also climate jobs that we see as being important. Um, there's an educational work that needs to be done in terms of teaching people um, about the climate crisis and cultural and arts programs can help in doing that. But culture and arts are also important in our society um, and we need culture and arts workers uh, in terms of uh, helping to generate not just the educational work that needs to be done to deal with this crisis, um, but also to facilitate all kinds of other things that are required in communities. Um, and the culture and the arts are very powerful tools in being able to deal with a lot of the social issues that we have in our country. And we want to support that and that is a low carbon job and that is what we see also as a climate job also and then obviously care community care work also is a low carbon job and is a climate job it needs to be supported it needs to be scaled up and it needs to be strengthened also so we want to put that front and center as 
a climate job that needs to be um, also taken into consideration. With regards to decarbonization, we're looking at energy cooperatives of public ownership and communities uh, to help facilitate socially owned uh, renewable energy. So there's a number of ways in which that will happen where you have community cooperatives uh, and uh, other community uh, ownership groups working with public entities like ESCOM, um, harnessing the social change and potential of renewable energy. I uh, want to implement energy democracy across the country. The way in which this country has been created, it's a colonial legacy, um, you know, the, the, the reliance on coal is a colonial remnant and it's, it's undemocratic and it's been constructed in that way for a purpose to control people, to control workers and to control the population. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a sign of our inequality and we want to implement and initiate energy democracy and that's what the decarbonization program will be based off of. We'll be restructuring energy systems to make sure the facilitation of this energy democracy is possible, redistribution and reconfiguration of energy systems across the country. Um, natural climate solutions are also part of uh, this, this decarbonization program, the electrification of all states' facilities, and the decarbonization of all state departments' facilities and processes is also very important. Um, I'm running out of time, so I just want to say that uh, other programs we have also with regards to ecocentric manufacturing, rethinking our industrial strategy has to be state-led and mission-oriented. We have a mission, we have a plan. The framework of the Charter, the Climate Justice Deal, um, will be the basis along which that industrial strategy is rethought of. Um, putting in place a Sustainable Economy Act, um, which will also set environmental limits across sectors of the economy to protect and make sure that those are uh, set in place and but set in law also. Um, and then finally, democratic planning in a people-driven climate justice state. Um, we have to rethink ownership. We're looking at democracy, we need to implement new ownership models across the economy. Um, and this is by ramping up, facilitating community and worker-owned cooperatives, uh, but also uh, allowing for community and worker ownership in existing large, uh, uh, corporations within our, 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 our country, particularly ones that have benefited off the resources of this country over the past hundred years. Um, the Department of Small Businesses can also be repurposed to or the creation of a Department of Cooperatives also, or Cooperative Ownership. Uh, regional and National Climate Justice Deal Planning Councils will be put in place to make sure these plans are implemented at a local level, municipal level, regional and national level. Um, and they'll also be made up of uh, community, not just uh, politicians, but there has to be a significant community and uh, civil society um, presence uh, within those uh, uh, bodies. Um, every city and town will be a transition town. So these councils also will look at transitioning and have a mandate to, um, to implement and draw up these frameworks, climate justice skill frameworks, in terms of how to implement these changes within their cities and towns. Uh, we'll create new uh, state institutions for a climate justice deal to make sure it's implemented. Uh, one of the ones I spoke about was the Climate uh, Works Program. That will be a new government institution body that will employ people across the country to do this work. Um, a Climate Justice Deal Act will also be put in place uh, to make sure that the uh, work of uh, the executive or the work of our departments are in line and fit with uh, what is required for a climate justice deal to be put in place, uh, reformatting the Presidential Climate Commission to make it more democratic and purposeful for being able to implement this plan, uh, repurposing bodies like uh, NEDLAG to allow for more democratic and transparent cross-sectoral planning. Um, yeah, and I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Wander. I think that that was quite extensive. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think that that is, I think one of the most exciting things about being part of the Climate Justice Charter Movement is that we always looking at um, how do we make this happen? So we don't just provide slogans, we actually look at ways of making things happen. And that has been one of the exciting things. I, I almost kind of think 
it would be such a thing if the presidential commission can actually take on this document um, and, and engage with it, you know? But we know that's not gonna happen anytime soon. I want to now hand over to Comrade Vish, <clears throat> who will give us the overview of the CJC policy work and some of the things we've done. And then we will have a 45 minute discussion or I think more or less, cause I think we've run out of time. So <coughs> over to you Vish. Yes, yes. So comrades, um, why are we translating the Climate Justice Charter into policies? This is the question. Now, this morning we heard from one of our leading climate scientists in the country that we are losing the fight to prevent a 1.5 degree Celsius overshoot, which means we are going to be at three degrees within the next decade. And that's going to be very, very challenging for our country and for our society. And that means with the kind of foresight of climate science, we need to place this country on a climate emergency footing now. And that's one of the primary reasons why we are translating the charter into policies. The second reason why we are doing this conference is because the Climate Justice Charter is a plurivision. Now, what does that mean, pluri? Pluri means multiple vision. It means, comrades, that the Charter speaks to our past. It speaks to the legacies of dispossession, of exploitation, and inequalities that were constructed under colonialism and apartheid. So we look back with the Charter. We are not ahistorical. We recognize where we come from, and we recognize that those harms must be addressed as part of climate justice politics. We also look at the present with the Charter. We look at the general crisis of social ecological reproduction in our society. In the last panel registered for us the intersecting crisis tendencies that are impacting all of us. So the Charter helps us recognize that we need a holistic approach to a country and a world in crisis in the present, in the now. The Charter also is a plurivision because it looks to the future. It looks to what can we build now to secure a climate justice future? What do we need to do to ensure a livable future? So that's the second reason, comrades, why we are translating the Climate Justice Charter into policies, to address the spooky vision as best as we can, to give detail, to give nuts and bolts, to give the mechanics of policy that can tackle the past, that can tackle the crises of the present and secure our futures. The third reason, comrades, why we are translating the charter into policy is because the climate and the general social ecological crisis we are living through, which is the fourth general crisis of capitalism, gives us an opportunity to rethink everything. It gives us an opportunity to challenge a system that is destroying all of planetary life, human and non-human. It gives us an opportunity, comrades, to push the boundaries of debate, the boundaries of thinking, the horizons of imagination. And so this is another reason why we are translating the charter into, into policies. The fourth reason why we are translating the charter into policies, comrades, is because of what came out earlier and which we all recognize. There's a crisis of leadership. There's a crisis of political leadership. There's a crisis of policy leadership. There's a crisis of global leadership. And so it's up to us, comrades, to forge ahead and to think ahead and to champion those policies, those alternatives based on the charter that will secure our futures. So that's why, comrades, we have started this process. Now, Awande has spoken to the issue of the climate justice deal. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but except to underline 
The charter calls for this macro intervention in our society. So the neoliberal class project of the African National Congress Alliance has been a disaster for this country. It's a class project that has failed on every term, of, on every metric, on any argument, it has failed. We need a macro response to that. And that's what the climate justice deal is about. Okay. Now, Awane has alluded to some of the key thinking behind it, etc. I just want to amplify two themes very quickly. The one is this idea of, yes, a macro intervention for a climate justice deal, anchored in certain policies and laws, etc. But at the same time, it is driven from below. We must remember this. This is a democratic systemic reform that can shift the direction of the economy and the society and the state. Now that's a big shift to bring about, a big power shift to bring about. And that is why our activism as a movement and as activists must be to drive this climate justice deal from below. People and workers' power must drive this. We are also talking about, and it will, come, it will become clearer after this workshop conference because we brought many ideas here and we're looking forward to your debates and engagements. But this is going to be a broad umbrella framework, the macro intervention. But we're also going to have micro level climate justice deal. And we'll talk more about this tomorrow. So I just want you to keep that in mind in workplaces, in communities, in sectors, and generally in the state. So this is something that we all need to own and champion. To decarbonize a workplace, to adapt a workplace requires a deal, a just deal, so that workers do not get screwed in that process. The second theme, comrades, that a policy thrust that we're busy with is water. The charter calls for the democratizing of the water commons. And in this regard, comrade Ferial Adam, who's chairing the session, is leading our thinking on this. And here, comrades, the one point I want to just stress is that we are facing a drier future. We are facing a mega drought that's coming in the next El Nino effect. Uh, we are also going to be facing uh, extreme downpours and flooding. So the water policy that we are trying to design and invent based on the charter is really about how do we plan in these extremes? How do we have a policy framework that can deal with acute shortages and scarcity on the one hand, on the other hand, deal with extremes of water inundation on the other. This is very, very important. So this is, this is a crucial imperative guiding this policy. And the charter says we must democratize the water commons in South Africa. 62% of our water currently is allocated to industrial agriculture. It's highly inefficient. It is not uh, useful to our society. There's over plus minus 5,000 dams on these farms. Now that doesn't mean we want to undermine farmers. But again, this is not the kind of food, water allocation we can go with into the future, a drier future, a future of climate extreme. So some deep thinking Comrade Ferial is doing with us around this issue. And we're inviting you also as we draft to be part of shaping this. The other framework or the other systemic alternative in the charter is the rights of nature and natural climate solutions. And here we, we are doing deep thinking led by comrade Charles Simane and COPAC around what is the importance of our natural commons and ecosystems, okay? So everything we have, our clothes, our food, our medicines, etc come from the natural commons the ecological foundation of our society okay our plants our trees our forests our biodiversity our rivers our soil etc etc so how do we protect this not in the old apartheid era conservation approach no how do we think about the rights of nature differently informed by our own indigenous ecologies because the people that came before colonialism and before apartheid 
had a very different relationship with the commons and natural systems. And that doesn't mean going primitive. That means learning from their philosophy of how they lived with nature. That's very, very important for the present. What was the ethics that the peoples of the past, the ancients practiced that we can use today? Very, very important. How do we deal with uh, lots of private reserves and our national parks in South Africa? Should we, we, should we be working towards bioregions for the country? Now, why are bioregions important? They are important because the shrubs, the trees, the flowers, the plants, the forests, etc., absorb carbon. They absorb one of the most important greenhouse gases. So if we protect all of what we have, a unique floral kingdom in the Western Cape, unique uh, felt scapes in other parts of the country, etc. If we give it resilience, if we give it the ability to survive and thrive and so on, and we mainstream that, we are ensuring that we are absorbing carbon. This is important. This is very, very important. So we are busy with that, and Comrade Charles is leading us on this. And again, with us, we can shape this. The other policy that we're very advanced on is zero waste and simple living. And again, comrades, uh, maybe to underline all these alternatives we're talking about, water commons, uh, rights of nature, uh, zero waste, these come from grassroots forces. Zero waste comes from the waste pickers in our country. But what's striking about zero waste, comrades, is that if we redesign products, for example, so that they last longer, not two years, not three years, but 20, 30 years, we already have the makings of a different economy and a different society. The kind of society we live in is throw away. Things are designed to perish and end up in the bin and then landfill, okay? So this is something that we are thinking about very carefully. We're also thinking about the idea of uh, the consumption side. And that came up with what Imran said earlier on about how we live, okay? The choices we make. We're gonna have to have an ecological revolution in consciousness on the consumption side. <laughs> because the way we, we, we participate in the industrial food system, which contributes about 30 to 40% of global emissions, is killing us. So we're going to have to think about relocalizing, re-embedding the food sovereignty and so on, uh, our food system. We're going to have to think about living with an ethics of sufficiency. You don't need multiple homes, you don't need big cars, etc. Okay, we need to learn to live with what is sufficient within the parameters of our life-giving ecosystems, within the parameters of planet Earth, and so on. So there's a big debate to be had here, because in mainstream consciousness, it's all about what you can acquire, what you can consume, what you can buy, and so on and so on. So there's, there's a big shift that has to happen in society. And so we're working on these ideas, and together with all of you, we're going to finalize them. The third important area we're working on, uh, uh, fourth important area we're working on, very quickly on the wrap up, is food sovereignty. The charter calls for feeding South Africa through food sovereignty. You heard from Jane's presentation that we have a methodology, we have an approach to end hunger in South Africa and to transform the food system. The idea of setting up food sovereignty hubs across the country. If we had the money, we had power in this country. We would set up food sovereignty hubs across the country so that communities, villages, towns, and cities can feed themselves and can ensure they can handle the climate shocks that are coming. The commercial, industrial, globalized food system has failed us and is going to continue to fail us. We need the next food system. So this policy, comrades, is going to argue for the hubs to be scaled up across the country. It's going to be arguing for agroecology to be mainstreamed across our society. It's going to be arguing for us to adopt the People's Food Sovereignty Act so we can democratically plan our food system. So comrades, these are some of the policy thrusts we've been working on this year. 
They're going to be coming forward in the next month or two as drafts. And we want to then invite all of you and all the people who are joining the movement, etc., to engage with us on these drafts. By next year, comrades, we want to catalyze more working groups on all the other policy thrusts in the Charter. Again, we're inviting all of you to participate in that. We need policies around climate jobs. We need policies around clean energy, public transport, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Vish. Um, I think that um, every time I hear all the work that we're doing as COPEC and as the movement, it's exciting. And I'm sure it's, it's, the, it's just what we need sometimes to reignite our drive and our commitment. I can't see, um, I don't know what the decision is on questions, um, maybe about 10 minutes, because I know it's be eating into lunchtime. Yeah, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So I can only see people online. You're gonna have to guide me for people in the room who have questions. It's open, the floor is open, comrades. Any questions? If you want to type a question in, and if you're online, if you want to type a question in, I can also read that. I think it's a lot, comrades. It's a lot to take in, I guess, and in terms of you know putting this into practice and making it practical documents. So it's it's it's. I look forward to the engagement when it's done. But I do think that we will have some. Um, everyone in the room. My name is Bruno Simpugamitini. I came from Eastern Cape, um, founder of the Abane for Persons with Disabilities in the registered NPO that is actually is in Mamwe in Eastern Cape. Um, um, here, thank you very much to Cobert uh, uh, for this uh, opportunity to actually meet again as the um, activist. <coughs> I've got yes, a lot to say or comment on, but I will only because of time I mention this one thing that actually makes me proud to mention today that I managed to to do. I, I actually managed to listen to Mr. Marcus one day from one of our workshops when he was mentioning that if we say that we are the community and um, we are excluded children, <coughs> sorry, meaning that. We, we, we are exposing, we don't um, uh, involve children that we not say or do anything. So um, in that children inclusion, and it's been my cry, if Mr. Rich can, 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 can record for, for, for ages, that if when we actually like um, creating this CJC, we need to, to, to also create a children friendly, animated book for children because those guys when we have our 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 sessions with them um when we're teaching them about this cjc in the rural villages they they they, they very they very interested in this climate uh, crisis thing because they've seen it it's been happening in front of them but they let someone to actually come to them and teach them this so when we went to them they showed interest of of, of uh, learning from this. So if we can create those uh, children's friendly animated books for them to actually go together with all this, then we can, we can win this. Thank you. Um, Comrades, as usual, the way forward uh, in the way uh, Rwanda is presented, Perial was telling us, so the work that we're doing, and specifically the work that we're going to be doing in our policy, I mean, it's vital to the success. Well, it's, it's vital to addressing the climate crisis. In fact, our very survival is at stake. But I'm concerned, and I know there's a lot of work that's been done at university level, in schools, and all of that. But I'm still concerned that we haven't reached critical mass to be able to achieve what we want to achieve. If we, if we talk about We've learned from, from the Charter itself, uh, years and years of work that went into the Charter, presenting it to government, 
and then I think it's someone it's in someone's waste paper basket somewhere in Parliament. I'm not sure that it's receiving any kind of attention. And the reason for that, to my mind, and it may be a naive interpretation, is that we simply didn't make, or we, we simply cannot make a loud enough noise or a disruptive intervention that forces them to take notice. So my question is really quite simple is, what are we going to do to make this the central campaign in the country, actually it's not even a campaign, it's the reality of making sure that it's uh, supported by millions of people. You know, I follow someone on um, on Twitter called uh, Peter Kalmas, and he's referred to as a climate human, right? The scientist, quite famous. But what he says always makes me think in the morning. He says, you know, we're 9 billion or 7 or 8 billion people. In order to break through this climate crisis and ensure our survivability, we don't have to be a few hundred thousand. We actually need to be 1 billion climate climate. Uh, climate activists in the world. So that means one in seven people needs to be a climate activist. So what is that number in South Africa? Is it one in 69 million? Do we need 69,690,000 or 6.9 million climate activists in the country? So how do we get? Because I see a lot of the same people in our interventions here. Maybe we 30 people in the room, maybe another 30 on the on the call and maybe on Facebook a few. But it's simply not enough. To get uh, to make that breakthrough, so how are we going to ensure we do that? Especially if we want to translate these things into policy. You know, it takes laws. It's a long, it's a long game. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm the Board of the from the West Coast. A small rural, uh, a small rural fishes village, and I'm here on behalf of the Green Sentinel. So I think she does me. Yes, uh, I think I did met Professor Wilson in Cape Town. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My crying today, Professor, and I'm gonna ask you the question. I'm just gonna brief you, give you a quick brief from what happening now in our place, in our area, and the climate change is already there. It's inside, we see it, we love it. Uh, we are a small fisher store nearby Lambus Bay. Maybe you know Lambus Bay, but Warren Bay is 35 kilometers from Lambert's Bay. And we are facing that crisis now. All the mining companies come to our places now to come and mine. They want to mine, but they come and say they want to do research. But we know that they have done the research two years before because we saw the big boats and stuff there, but we didn't know what is happening there. So now they go to the, uh, to the government and government give them permits they give them a right to come and mine for diamonds. They come and they stole our resources. And uh, Professor said something about the indigenous people. They love with the nature. They speak to nature. And that is exactly what happened there. The sea is our livelihood. My father is a fisherman for 50 years. And I've been born in Dwaran Bay, and since I can remember, my father provided for us out of the sea. And so does 99% of the Dwaran Bay fisher folk, women, men and women go to sea, men and women, to feed the children. And now we start in this crisis, is there now. And our municipality, They've been bright already. Our councillors, our ward councillors, they have been bright already because they have been in separate meetings, in private meetings with this mining company's bosses. And all they see now, their eyes can just see the money in the well. And we see with our heart because in the sea, in this ocean, our heart beat, beats in that ocean. We are spiritual linked to that ocean. 
because me myself was baptized in that ocean. It's an 11 years old daughter. My eldest daughter, she's 32 today. The middle one is 21 and my son is 18. The all three of them were baptized in that water. When I lay on my bed and I sit like that on my bed, I look straight into the sea. I can see the whales coming. They learn the small ways swimming. I see, I look at them for the whole day. I can just sit in my room and staring at them and see what they do. Season, we have season, fish season, like it's snook season. We have crayfish season. Dwarambai doesn't have a snook season for two years now. Because the snook swim in the deep sea, far from Dwarambai, because of the diamond boats that is mining gray sand out of the sea in the bay. And what is happened? They disturb the habitat in the sea. And the fish and the species in the sea is very accurate when they hear something. Now they, they swim away. There wasn't a snook season in Dwarambai, in every other places. Dwarambai doesn't catch crayfish anymore because the crayfish came and they laid their eggs in the rocks and on the clouds. And then the mother fishes, even the fish, every species they came to the bay and they lay their eggs there. And they wait until the small fish they, uh, are strong and then they go into the disease. But that doesn't happen anymore because of the small, and that is the, the diamond boats that is working there now, it's small diamond boats and they doesn't mine for big diamonds now. There's only boats, they take the gravel sand out of the water, out of the bottom of the sea, and then they surf it and they find the small diamonds. So what is going to happen if the big diamond and the big mining companies came and they come and mine in our water? They're going to let us with a dead sea because everything in that sea is going to go away. They're going to die, going to die. And what about us? So they are putting us into hunger and into a hunger and they are trying to kill us. So we have to stop them because they're going to kill the whole people in that West Coast area. So that is my cry. What can we do, Professor? Is there something because even the government, local government and provincial government, they give the people the rights to go and mine in our seas. We heard the cry of the people. We talk to the sea, the sea, when my father wants to wake up and go to sea in the morning, he doesn't have to stand up and go out and go see if the sea is the right for him to go out with him. They talk spiritual. The sea, even the sound of the sea, then they know, no, this is not the right day to go to sea today. This is the indigenous fishes, aboriginal indigenous fishes of Warambai. They had that spiritual connect, connect with the sea water. Even our children know, you don't go swim there, don't go with that gap, don't go there, because they know the sea, that sea, that ocean is like the palm of their hand. So we are, we are now facing a big, big crisis. If they are not going to be strong, then we're going to die. Because everything in that sea, this is our heartbeat. I have a, a request, um, and it's around um, song, music, entertainment. Um, how to translate this big subject um, and touch hearts of kids and youth. Um, this little gift, I'm so happy. Thank you. This is the best gift I could have had because India is a toolkit that you can take to kids and say, listen, come, let's paint something that connects you with the story of 
Oh, on the earth. So, so I say with tears in my eyes. That thank you. For this. I think our war is going to be won, not with the weapon, maybe not with the pen. <laughs> Hopefully, with the pen. Um, that leads me to something else that happened um, last week. Uh, I missed it. I, I was anyway. Um, we had the climate march at uh, Parliament and so forth uh, in Cape Town. Um, and I was first in the program when I was told at last. So my guitar did not arrive, and the song that I was supposed to present did not. I'm hoping that you've got a guitar for me for Shimada or for later. And I'll play you the songs that we've written. Um, two of these songs that when the children yell it, it's like within the second and third verse, not verse, line, the children are singing it. So it's uh, songs that are developed along, along the lines of earth songs. And I think we need so much of that. I think that uh, the, 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 the climate justice charter movement is going to gain, gain so much momentum and we need anthems. We need to create those anthems. I've got two or three already to, to, to let you hear and let's sing it. If it's not good, you can keep me out of the house. Uh, <laughs> but let's start that. Um, so yes, please, let's, let's talk about music and arts. And uh, I wonder you mentioned the, the culture and the arts. And, Love it. It is there's going to be we can gain lots of traction through that. Last point or last little bit. Can you please take me to your gardens? Um, I want to be all uh, how many do you have? The the foods on the quite, quite a few. Oh it's not really because I've got the I've got all the seedlings, I've got enough to start uh, in the cape. I've got a, a big piece of uh, a school down and we've got others. So I I, I that would probably be there the cape that Okay, so then, let's let's get the and anybody else in the Cape that wants uh, seedlings and uh, plants I've got, and we can we can connect them. Let's uh, let's share. Let's uh, get that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Comrades, this is Ferial online. Um, I think Patrick we are running out of uh, time. Transition Township Project at NMU. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm I'm in agreement with. 90% of what's been uh, said here. Um, uh, uh, the, the fact that we need a democratic planning process that's bottom up and not top, top down, uh, that we need to reorganize the way we produce things. You know, at the moment, we're reflecting the global system instead of coming up with alternatives. Um, and, that, and that means placing the means of production into the hands of the community, um, which the, the, the current sort of dynamic, pe the people are not trusted by the current powers that be, and that's the, the, one of the things we have to change. Um, and I agree that, that it's food, water, and energy that are the key. Um, and then we, there's an, there's an additional, there's the repurposing of brownfield industrial sites as well. Um, and there's all these, these industries or these factories that are standing empty as a result of the changes in the global economy, they can be repurposed. Same thing with some of the apartheid infrastructure that we've inherited. And I can give details to people if they're interested, but there's a huge opportunity in front of us. Um, the, the amount of money that's going to have to be spent, and that's already on the table from people like the PCC, and we can get into the tactical engagements of how that proceeds. But these guys are going to spend upwards of three trillion rand over the next eight years to effect this transition. And the question then becomes, how much of that is going to go to the usual suspects and how much of it is going to be placed in the hands of the people? And we need to find a way of articulating that it makes economic sense, political sense, uh, sense in terms of, of philosophy and justice, morality, that we give people the right to produce and access to markets. And just to give you an idea of what I mean, you know, the, the current production of, of electricity in this country so far this year is about 197 terawatt hours, which is 40 terawatt hours short of what the demand was. Now we could have produced that, that 40 terawatt hours and sold it to the market. If we'd, be, if we'd had the, if the government had listened to us five years ago when we started saying this kind of thing, or even before, more than five years, if we'd had the, 
that if the, if, the, if the investment funds had been made available for us to build out community-owned renewable energy projects, we could have supplied that for Terramod hours, which incidentally is worth 80 billion rand a year. You know? Now, we don't have the capacity to do that as we speak, but we need to think seriously about what it's going to take to build that capacity. And energy is the key because it's relatively easy to do you link it to food and water. There's a, there's a nexus between those three. And there already is this all over the country, you've got, you've got food production going. And that provides a, a stepping stone to the next stage, which is manufacturing industrial production itself. And there we're talking about the repurposing of the industrial ecosystem towards the kinds of things that people are saying, which is meeting the daily needs of, the, of the, our society in a, so, in, in a way that the production is actually socialized. And I won't go, I'll leave it there, but it's about, we need to, to, to it doesn't matter whether robots are doing the production, so long as we own the robots. You see what I'm saying? We need, to, we need to own the means of production and socialize the production systems. And again, I don't have the definitive answer, but that's the, that to, from, our, from our perspective, that's where the conversation needs to go. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not sure if there were any questions from the chat for those online, um, but I'll hand it over to Ferial just to give any kind of closing response, um, addressing the wonder, questions and then to wrap up also for the session. I wonder, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I was like almost on mute by the, by by default, um, there was one question online, but we lost the person. Uh, she fell off, it was Shirley. So we lost that question. But um, I think that there's been some very, very useful contributions. And, um, you know, I mean, even, even uh, Sunny talking about the fact that we have, we are, how, where's this groundswell? And that, and that takes time. I think the fact that we might be a small, group in the room and online. But I do think that the Climate Justice Charter has gone far beyond just our borders. And that's something we need to remember and that activism can spread that way. Um, and I think it's, it's an ongoing piece of work and we need to continue. I do think that we need to monitor, you know, this section was about the, the, the Presidential Climate Commission. But I do think that we need to look at how is it that some of our comrades are sitting on their commission, but we can see that we're not achieving what we need to achieve and we need to put it to them that some of these practical papers should be added in. But on that note, I think, I thank you comrades. I thank everyone for their contributions. I want to now go and visit our comrade and watch the whales as well. Um, I think we're going to break now for lunch is my understanding. But thank you so much. And I'm really sorry that I could not be there. I was not going to risk making everyone ill. But uh, yes, yeah, so I think that it for us, we break now for lunch. Um, I wonder, can you just make sure that we've stopped recording? Yes, thank you. <laughs>